If you are able to remain standing, please remain standing. As Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem, he is involved with two dramatic healings in Mark 5, verses 21 through 28. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet, and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. This is the word of the people of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So as Jesus has now turned his face toward Jerusalem, and all that it would mean in confronting the temple authorities and facing the powers of the Roman Empire, we see that his ministry of love and healing never stopped. He crosses back from the Decapolis, the uh, the. West, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the ten Gentile cities, remember? And he's been in the country of the Gerasenes, and uh, remember how he healed the Gerasene demoniac? Now he's back on the Jewish side in an area around Capernaum, which was Jesus' home base in the Galilee. And Mark tells this sandwich story. It's a story, two stories that are skillfully woven together. And both of the stories have women as central characters. And the number 12 becomes uh, important. The woman had been ill for 12 years, 12 long years. And we will learn later on in the further telling of the story that uh, J. Iris' daughter is 12 years old. In other words, this woman had been sick as long as the little girl had been alive. Wow. Now there's some other interesting contrasts uh, in these two stories. We see characters of different genders and economic statuses and honor. Uh, Jairus is male and a synagogue ruler as well as the leader of his household. The synagogue ruler in those days was uh, maybe the most important person, the most respected person in his community. And he certainly would have known of this uh, Jesus. And he would have known Jesus to be an outsider, uh, a dangerous heretic. One that a person of his position would have uh, tried to stay away from. But Jairus is transformed into nothing more than a desperate father. And then there's this woman with the flow of blood. She's never even given a name in the story, so she has no status except for being an untouchable, shut off from the Jewish community. Her condition places her outside the people of God as she's rendered ritually impure at all times. Listen to what it says in Leviticus about this flow of menstrual blood. It's in the 15th chapter, the 25th verse. If the menstrual flow of blood continues for many days beyond the normal period, or if she discharges blood unrelated to her menstruation, the woman will be ceremonially unclean as long as the discharge continues. Anything on which she lies or sits during that time will be defiled, just as it would be during her normal menstrual period. If you touch her bed or anything on which she sits, you will be defiled. 
You will be required to wash your clothes and bathe in water, and you will remain defiled until evening. This woman not only had to deal with the physical pangs of her condition for 12 years, but think of what a social outcast she had been and her long, long suffering. And she's also poor. Uh, she spent all of her money, we learn, and has not gotten any better. In fact, it says she's even gotten worse. Physicians have been unable to help her. And, yet, and finally, she comes upon the true physician. He comes on the scene. And notice that when the wealthy and powerful Jairus wants Jesus to heal his daughter, he has to wait until he heals the destitute woman. Jesus sets the priorities right. Let's pray. Lord, we come on Sundays and we come on our knees and we come in prayer to you so often because we know that you set the scales right. We know that at the foot of the cross and its shadow, everyone is on equal footing. And we need to remember that as we jostle for position in this world. It's when we all can be as one uh, that we draw close to your heart. Help us as we continue to hear the story and to learn from it. And as we draw closer to you during this time, this season of repentance and self-inspection and renewed love for you. Amen. Now I want to show you the story fully told in Capernaum by our famous storyteller, Tracy Radosevic, during our Holy Land trip in January. Uh, let's watch her as she tells it in full. So they're back home in Capernaum. Jesus gets out of the boat and he was met by, guess who? A throng, a huge crowd of people, exactly. And he was with them there beside the sea. Now in this crowd, there came uh, a man. He was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Jairus was his name. And when he got to Jesus, he fell on the ground in front of him and began to beg over and over again. My little girl. My little girl. My little girl is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jesus agreed. And so he began to follow Jairus, as did the entire throng, the entire crowd who pressed in on all sides. Now in this throng, there was a woman who had suffered with a flow of blood for 12 years. She had been to many doctors, had spent everything she had, but she hadn't gotten any better. In fact, she'd actually grown worse. But she'd heard the stories about Jesus. And so she came up, came up behind him in the crowd, and she touched his garment, and she said to herself, if I just touch his garment, I will, I will be made. Well, and immediately she, she felt within her body that she had been healed of her disease. Well, Jesus, sensing the power had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched me? And his disciples said to him, Teacher, you see this crowd of people pressing in on all sides. How can you ask who touched you? <laughs> but Jesus looked to see who had done it. It was a woman. 
knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and falling on the ground before him. She, she told him the whole truth. And Jesus said to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. But while he was still speaking, there came some from the house of the ruler of the synagogue who said, uh, your, um, your daughter, she's dead. Why bother the teacher any further? But Jesus said to Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. And this time he allowed no one to go with him except for Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Now when they entered the house of the ruler of the synagogue, they, they were met by a tumult, people weeping and wailing loudly. And going further into the house, Jesus said to them, why are you crying and causing this commotion? The child isn't dead, she's really sleeping. This. <laughs> so Jesus kicked him out and taking with him the parents of the little girl as well as those who had come with him they went into the room where the little girl lay and taking her by the hand he said to her she got up and she started to walk around. Because you see, she was 12 years. Now everyone who witnessed this was utterly astonished. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what they had just seen. And to give her something to eat. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so be it. So be it. So it is. So it is. There are several themes that I could talk about, including uh, the, the draining power of service and, and of healing, of the mourners, of, of uh, faith, of the messengers. But I just want to concentrate on the power of touch for the next couple of moments. The woman with the flow of blood thinks to herself, if I but can touch the fringe of his garment, I can be made whole. I can be well. Can you imagine the humiliation and the embarrassment she not only was going to be breaking all the purity rules by mixing with the crowd and therefore really making all of them unclean, but also by touching Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, she would make him unclean. So when people saw her coming, uh, they must have to some extent distanced themselves from her so that they wouldn't brush up uh, against her. For they knew of that touch. Think of the risks she took. If only, though, I can touch the fringe of his cloak. Then we see the, the theme of uh, touch played out with Jesus tenderly taking Jairus's daughter by the hand. In both parts of the sandwich story, Jesus touches the unclean at a great risk for himself. Again, let's go back to uh, the Torah in Numbers 19. All those who touch a dead human body will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves on the third and seventh days with the water of purification 
then they will be purified. But if they do not do this on the third and seventh day, they will continue to be unclean even after the seventh day. All those who touch a dead body and do not purify themselves in the proper way defile the Lord's tabernacle and will be cut off from the community of Israel. That's the risk Jesus took. But look what happens when he does risk, when he does defy the law and all those cultural barriers. He ends up reversing the outcome. Instead of becoming impure, he removes what causes the two women to be unclean and restores them to wholeness and life. The woman, the woman with, the un, with the flow of blood was an outcast. Now, with the touch of Jesus, she becomes elevated to the status of daughter. Did you hear his words? Daughter, your faith has made you well. She's now a daughter again of Israel. No longer to be judged as an untouchable. Jesus blesses her and tells her to go in peace. A peace that includes not only her physical healing, but a full, complete relationship now with God and with her people. And with a dear 12-year-old girl, he says, Talitha kum. Talitha kum. It's a tender Aramaic expression that means, little girl, arise. Then he's concerned about the little one getting something to eat. The sense of touch is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. Amen. When you work with the poor, when you go into a, an IHN, YWCA family center, and you serve the poor, and you touch little children that are homeless, and there's something about that touch that not only brings sometimes great joy and smiles and assurance and comfort to the poor, but it does something to you. There's something about the touch in Jesus' name that transforms. There's a sense of touch in the laying on of hands in prayer. That there's, this, there's a spirit that enters into the moment when you lay hands on and, and you bless someone. Uh, there's a healing force that sometimes is uh, unleashed. And that's why I want our church to be a more intentional healing and praying uh, community. There's a sense of touch in marriage. Remember when you, if you're married or when you've dated, how much you just loved holding hands. The Beatles sang a song, I want to hold your hand. Um, there's a sense of touch. And when marriages go awry, because I do my fair share of marital counseling, uh, usually I hear one or both of them saying, but the other one doesn't even want to hold my hand anymore. Never wants to put his or her arm around me. Never wants to touch me. Uh, there's something about touch that makes us human and connects us with uh, God. Yesterday, I had the privilege of helping to officiate the wedding of Tenny Williams. Many of you know Tenny. He got married at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church uh, on Ohio State's campus to Nancy Bueller. Both of them are well into their 80s. This is the third marriage for both of them. Both of their previous spouses, they have uh, died. Nancy was married once 23 years, and then again 30 years. Uh, Tenny was married, a lot of you remember Marianne, for 55 years, and uh, then more recently, almost three years, to Annie. Uh, there's a mystery in this uh, sense of love. But as, and I can only, and 
and Reverend Glazer, we could only see this, but as we stood there and they gave their vows to each other, and I like the way George Glazer did this. When uh, Tenney gave his vows, he said, now, I want you to hold her hand. And, and these 80-year-old hands plus your old hands were tenderly holding each other. And then after that, he said, now, let your hands go to the side. And now, um, Nancy, I want you to hold Tenney's hands as you give your vows to him. And the, the, the tenderness was something. And then as they gave each other their ring, and only, only I and George could see this, uh, Tenney puts the ring very gently on Nancy's finger. But with age, you know, our knuckles get, uh, uh, get swollen. And he couldn't get that f ring on. But he just, he just tried to massage so lovingly. I don't know if he ever got it on, but, but he just, I just watched him just lovingly do that. And then she couldn't hardly get it on his finger and did the exact same thing. There's, a, there's power in the sense of touch. It brings us together in a, uh, an equation of humanity where God is in the center of it. And I remember in my homily to them, they just had lost each other. They had lost a spouse. Uh, actually, Nancy had just three months before this moment had lost her second husband in September of 2012. In December of 2012, at a Christmas party at Thurber Retirement Community, she decided that she was going to boldly ask him to dance. So she held out her hands to touch his. And they danced. And it made me think of the psalm uh, where David in Psalm 30 says, You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have removed my sackcloth, my funeral clothes, and clothed me with, in joy and in gladness. So may that be our vision, to dance, to celebrate in baptism, in companionship, in servanthood, uh, so that the Lord will bless us and give us unspeakable joy as we connect with Him. Let's continue this road to Jerusalem with our Lord. He'll take, give us these uh, treasures of interruption along the way like that we had today in Capernaum.